Hello, Lost Friends, and thank you for joining us here on Freckles and Blondie. We are your hosts. I'm Tiffany. And I'm Randy. And today we are discussing episode seven of Lost, The Moth. This episode was co-written by Jennifer Johnson and Paul Dini. Jennifer will write one more episode in season one about Kate, and this is Paul's only episode of Lost. So both of them are relatively, you know, one-shotters. The episode was directed by Jack Bender, who is like quickly becoming the go-to director for this show. He also did Tabula Rasa and Walkabout. So... He's doing pretty good. Yeah, they really like him. <laughs> I'm not, like, one to really notice direction, <laughs> unless it's, like, horrible. Yeah, same. I feel like I'm definitely more attuned to the writing of a show, just because that's what I'm drawn to, but... Right. You know, direction seems pretty good, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, so far it's been pretty great, in my opinion as well, so <laughs> good job, Jack. <laughs> in my humble opinion. So, what was your overall impression of the episode? Uh, okay, so I love this episode. I mentioned this last time. This is one of my favorite episodes of Lost. It's got everything that I like. It's got Charlie, whom I love. I love his story. It's got a lot of Jack and Kate stuff, which, you know, I'm a fan of. It does have everything you love, like, specifically. Yeah. <laughs> got like all your favorite people it really does i loved it too i thought it was amazing <laughs> oh good i wasn't sure if you would like it as much. <laughs> no i thought it was really really well done and charlie is not normally one of my favorite characters i don't like dislike him or anything he's just not the kind of character i'm drawn to but i thought this episode was really good and i really liked his story yeah, he does such a good job. He does. And he's very sympathetic. He really is. And I'm already predisposed to like him. <laughs> like I've said previously, I love Dominic Monaghan, the actor who plays him. Yeah. So I enjoy this episode immensely. Yeah. It's like when things are so good, it's almost harder to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. This might be a very short episode of Freckles and Blondie this week. <laughs> Don't worry. There's plenty of Sawyer in this episode, so I'm sure we'll argue about oh, it. <laughs> that's true. Never mind. <laughs> Sawyer is very interesting in this episode, so I'm looking forward to hearing what your take is on him. Yeah, I went back and forth on all the things he did in this episode. So yeah, it should be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and get started then. We open up with Charlie strumming on his guitar. He's visibly sweating and shaking, and Locke asks him to go for a walk, persisting even as Charlie refuses. Jack is examining Kate's mugshot when she stumbles upon him. Not awkward at all. He once again <laughs> tells her that the caves are a better place to live at, and Kate says that he's just mad at her. He says he doesn't understand why she won't come with him. Or with us. <laughs> Kate reminds him it's only been eight days since the plane crash, and Saeed has a plan to send out a distress signal. Jack is unconvinced and thinks there's no way off the island, since the French woman obviously was never rescued. He says, I wish I shared your faith. I feel like it's not super obvious that the French woman was never rescued. Yeah, I mean, they don't know that at this yeah, point. Yeah, I feel like that's a leap. Because if rescue did come for her, she probably wasn't like, hold on, let me run back and turn my recording off before right. you take me. That's always bothered me. <laughs> Whenever they assume that, I'm like, why? Why? You don't know that. I think I would assume that because I'm just more pessimistic. <laughs> so if I'm on a creepy island with polar bears and s no monsters in the jungle, my first thought would be, oh, she definitely never got rescued. That girl's a goner. <laughs> Right, she got killed in some horrible, horrible way. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, I would definitely concede that that's a possibility, but I wouldn't be so sure that that's exactly what happened. Yeah. But what do you think of this conversation they have? I like it. I mean, I think Jack seems he seems a little pissed off in the, when they're have when they're talking about the caves versus the beach, but I think he's just 
worried about Kate. That's what I took from it anyway. Yeah. I I feel like he takes it as like a personal insult that Kate did not come. <laughs> like he's just so personally bothered by it and right cuz he's so into her. Like you said when he slips up and says I just don't understand why you won't come with me us. <laughs> like he's like, "Oh, wait a right. minute." <laughs> He just doesn't get it. (laughs) Yeah. And I also just love the way he was just staring at her mugshot. (laughs) Like, if I could get a guy to just stare at my mugshot the way Jack is staring at Kate's, I would be all set. (laughs) (laughs) Did you get the feeling that he was looking at it, like, like lovingly? Because I assumed he's staring at it wondering what she did. Oh, See, I just assumed that he was just staring at it, like missing her because she didn't come with. The, well, that's the way Kate him. plays it off too. So, who knows? Who knows what that dude's thinking? <laughs> yeah, he's hard to read sometimes. That's for sure. <laughs> they are interrupted by Sawyer, who is happily moving his things into Jack's former beach abode. He waves a cheerful goodbye, and Jack looks very annoyed and walks away. <laughs> I do love that wave he gives at the end of the scene. <laughs> it's so, I don't know, it's so Sawyer. It's so funny. <laughs> it is very funny to see Sawyer be perky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he definitely charms himself in every scene. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not every scene. <laughs> right. Most scenes. <laughs> Charlie is walking through the jungle when he hears a growl and then a shriek. He begins to run when we transition to a flashback of Charlie in a confessional admitting to having physical relations with multiple women. He says it's because of his band and that the temptations are everywhere. He says he's going to have to quit the band. He leaves the confessional and he sees Liam sitting in a pew who tells him he needs to relax. Their band just got a record deal and Charlie is going to be a rock god. We cut back to Charlie running from the boar, and just in the nick of time, one of Locke's handy-dandy nets swoops the boar up into the air. Charlie is super not amused, as Locke tells him what great bait he makes. He demands that Locke give him his drugs back. He needs them. I was just going to say, not cool, Locke. (laughs) Not okay. (laughs) I know, he's just got these nets everywhere. Maybe he should warn people, make some signs or something. Right, or maybe don't use Charlie as bait for the 150-pound boar <laughs> that just comes crashing through the jungle. I'm so mad that I'm me. It all worked out perfectly. Locke knew exactly what that boar was going to do. He's one with the island. Yeah, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> Locke tells Charlie that he is stronger than he realizes, but that he'll make him a deal. And if Charlie asks him three times, he will give his drugs back. Charlie asks why he's torturing him. Why not just destroy the drugs? But Locke says making choices is what separates us from animals like that boar. Right before slitting its throat, you know, for dramatic effect. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Dude knows how to make a point. (laughs) Uh, yeah, he does. (laughs) What do you think of his proposition? I, I like it. I feel like, again, he's just become this kind of spiritual leader for the island and the people on the island yeah you know it was jack before now it's charlie i mean, i like it i think it's a good it gives charlie a little bit more agency to make the decision on his own to give up his drugs you know yeah and then he's not gonna he won't be a victim of circumstance this way it won't be that he ran out or somebody took them from him like right. it gives him ownership like you said I love it, though. I think it's super brilliant. He's so, like, wise and sagely. Yeah, it kind of makes me forgive him a little bit for, you know, almost just getting Charlie (laughs) killed. Saeed is explaining how he is going to find the source of the French woman's distress signal so that they can turn it off and send one out of their own. He explains the plan to Kate and Boone. The three of them will spread out and turn their antennae on at the same time when he gives them the signal via firework rocket. They have to wait till the last second because their batteries don't have much life. The transceiver itself needs a new battery, perhaps like one in a laptop computer. So Kate heads over to the guy who has stuff. 
Ugh, who else? <laughs> she knows where to go. Yeah. Sawyer is enjoying another rousing chapter of Watership Down when Kate demands the laptop. She doesn't know if he has a laptop, but she seems pretty confident about it. <laughs> he asks if she's still upset about her breakup with Jacko, and Kate tells him he's living like a parasite, always taking, never giving. He doesn't want off the island because there's no one to go back to, no one who misses him. Sawyer asks if that means she feels sorry for him, and he, she says no. She pities him. He smiles and pulls out the laptop battery and hands it to her. Oh, Sawyer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good scene. It is a good scene. I feel like Kate's a little hostile. Yeah, I mean, I feel like her description is fitting. I think it's fitting, too. She just seems like... A little worked up. <laughs> but I mean, I guess from her point of view, or at least how I looked at it, I mean, the only reason for Sawyer to have laptops would be to hold it over everyone else who actually needs them. Right. But he doesn't. Yeah, but... <laughs> okay. I well, see, okay. Here's what I find significant in this scene. I think this is the first time Sawyer just gives someone something for nothing in return. Yeah, that's true. Do you think it's because it was Kate specifically who was asking him? Like, if Saeed had come over and asked, do you think he would have given Saeed the laptop battery? No. I think it is Kate, but I'm not sure if it's just because it's Kate or if it's because of the things she says. Mm. I'm wondering if he, like, respects her for saying all this stuff to him. He tells her, oh, you've got me pegged. So I'm wondering if he is kind of appreciating that... He can't deceive her, and she sees him for who he is? Ugh, I don't know. It's just, it's hard to imagine the mindset he was in when he was looting through all the luggage and he decided to take laptops along with God knows what else. Like, he had to have been thinking, I will, we're on an island, I'm not really technologically savvy, I will never use these laptops, but, you know... Maybe down the line, someone will need these and I can get something from them in return. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I do acknowledge that he does. This is the first time he's just given up something without getting something in return. But it's just so frustrating that he took them in the first place, along with God knows what else. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yes, I totally get what you're saying. I mean, he's definitely, I'm not, I'm not sure what the right word is. It's selfish. And I feel like he's looking for control like this is his way of getting some control and getting some power right right but i do like the scene between the two of them they have good i don't know if i'd say chemistry they have good energy they do have good chemistry randy just admit it i can't you know how i feel about jack and gay <laughs> you know actors can have chemistry with lots of different people it's okay that's true that's true. I'm just totally blinded by and the I'm, Jack and I'm thinking case. Evangeline Lilly just has chemistry. Her and anyone seem to do pretty well together. <laughs> That's true. I mean, I feel like she has moments with Saeed later in this episode. I'm like, huh. I thought so, too. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, at this point, let me ask you, do you want Sawyer and Kate to be together? Are you, like, interested in that p possible relationship or? Not at this point. I am interested in their conversations because, like, I'm not thinking about them right now, like, romantically. I'm interested in their mm -hmm. relationship because I feel like they're very honest with each other. And I find that really appealing. I Like, I was saying earlier that I feel like Jack and Kate kind of talk circles around each other a lot. And, you know, they're kind of secretive and whatever. But... Sawyer and Kate, I mean, they're kind of mean to each other, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they're they're both like being honest. So, just I just personally find that more interesting and that's what I want to see. Yeah, no, I will agree with that because the way Jack and Kate act around each other sometimes where they're like you said talking in circles, it does get a little wearing sometimes. But, yeah, Sawyer and Kate always, like, they don't really have any facades with each other. Yeah. So it's definitely interesting. Yeah, I get the feeling that neither of them feels the need to impress the other one. 
that they're just kind of like, I know who you are and you know who I am and it is what it is. We don't need to like try to be something we're not around each other. I get the feeling that Sawyer doesn't feel the need to impress anyone ever. (laughs) (laughs) That is true. (laughs) You know? (laughs) I do think Sawyer gets a little insecure around Jack, though. And I don't know if that's just because he can tell that Kate kind of has this thing for him or if he just is insecure about some leader dude telling him what to do. Yeah, I think it's more because of Kate and... You know, the whole Jack and Kate thing. I think Sawyer feels a little, I don't know if I'd say threatened, but. (laughs) (laughs) He definitely always seems interested in their relationship. He comments on it all the time. Yep, and he's always interrupting. (laughs) It's very annoying. (laughs) I mean, at the start of this conversation they just had, when she's getting all angry with him, he's like, are you still upset about your breakup with Jack? Yeah. (laughs) So there's more fascinating Sawyer stuff to come. Yeah, it'll be so interesting when we do next week's episode. Oh, Lord, don't even get me started. (laughs) Okay, yeah, me either. Okay, focusing. Okay, sorry, sorry. Jack is carrying some heavy bags into the caves. Charlie offers to help, and Jack tells him, no, no, it's fine. He doesn't need his help. Charlie grabs the bag anyway, but the zipper is broken and the contents spill out everywhere. Jack leaves with Hurley to go retrieve some more bags while Charlie rifles through all the medicine that fell out of the bag. When Jack returns, Charlie's holding some very strong anxiety medication, claiming he has a headache. Jack takes them from him, saying that that's not going to help his headache and that Charlie doesn't look so good. He needs to go get some water and take care of himself. Once again, he tells Charlie, I don't need you right now. Charlie looks dejected and grabs his guitar. Poor Charlie. (laughs) Could you be more emphatic that you don't need him, Jack? (laughs) I know. Well, I mean, I think he was trying to say it in a nice way, but Charlie obviously didn't take it that way. I think he's thinking, this is in your best interest. You need to go take care of yourself. You're not needed. Right. And Charlie's just like, please, I would love to be needed right now. (laughs) I know. He was trying to help. It was so sweet. He's like a little puppy sometimes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, he is. I just want to, like, Ugh. give him a hug and be like, it'll be okay, Charlie. In a flashback, Charlie is walking with Liam, who we learn is his brother. And they are at what appears to be... Is this the church that they were in? Uh, Yeah, I think so. Liam is upset because Charlie doesn't want to take the record deal. Charlie says that he loves the music, but the lifestyle and the fame is just not what he wants. He gets lost in it all. Liam asks Charlie why he would take away this opportunity from him. Charlie relents, making Liam promise that if he gets to be too much, if it gets to be too much, they walk away from it. I love their dynamic. I feel like they're so believable as brothers. They are. Charlie is just quintessential little brother who just wants his big brother to be happy with him. Oh, it's sad. It is sad. Charlie is definitely a people pleaser. Yes, absolutely. He needs that confirmation from other people. (laughs) Yeah. Poor dude. And this is not the place to be looking for it. No, it's not. (laughs) (laughs) Back on the island, Sun is wearing a spaghetti strap top, and Jin says she's indecent and should cover herself. She looks at him defiantly and tells him, it is hot. Hell yeah, Sun. Oh, snap. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I love that moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like this tiny little moment in the episode. But right. <laughs> it's, you know, Sun is kind of growing in her strength, slowly but surely. Right, and especially after everything that got revealed last week. It's like, yes, yeah, Sun. Yep. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Hurley brings Charlie his guitar case. Charlie is psyched that someone wants to talk music and drive shaft. But he misunderstood, and Hurley's just moving it because Jack said it was in the way. Charlie charges toward Jack, really angry, and tells him some people respect him. But Jack treats him like a joke, like he's not good enough to do anything. He's just in the way. Jack asks him to calm down, and Charlie tells him he doesn't know anything about him. He's a bloody rock god. Just then, the rocks begin falling and trap Jack beneath them. I love the irony of him saying, I'm a rock god, and then all the rocks start falling. (laughs) You know, to be completely honest, I'm not sure I ever noticed that until you just said 
it out loud, <laughs> which is really quite sad. But yeah, that is very ironic. <laughs> that had to be on purpose. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it was. I don't know how I missed it after I've only seen this episode 15 times. So, <laughs> <laughs> Poor Charlie, flying off the handle. It's so dramatic. <laughs> he is. I like that Jack doesn't really get angry with him. He tells him, you're not yourself. He knows this isn't who Charlie really is, that he's reacting to something. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like Jack, in his best moments, can really... I mean, he doesn't do this all the time, but when he's on his game, he can really read people and cater toward what they need most in the moment. You know what I mean? Mm Mm-hmm. I feel like in this moment, he's really good at calming him down, you know? Like, (laughs) not in time, but... (laughs) Right. (laughs) Like, he's making every effort to, like calm him and realize that Charlie's clearly going through something and, you know, not just picking a fight. Yeah, and he's not walking away or just being like, whatever, Charlie. He's trying to help. Yeah, he's assuming the best in him. That's what I like. Me too. Saeed and Kate are talking about the plane crash as they walk through the jungle. Saeed says the way that they crashed, they shouldn't have survived. But Kate says it's dumb luck. Sometimes things just happen. No rhyme, no reason. This was like a really quick scene, but I feel like it adds just that subtle little touch of magic Mm -hmm. because Saeed offers no explanation for this. And I'm wondering how he is rationalizing that in his head, that they should have died, but they didn't. Yeah, it seems kind of strange for him to say that. I couldn't really make anything of it because in that scene i kind of agree with kate like when she says they just survived off of blind dumb luck i would agree with her just because i would have no other explanation but they seem to really be emphasizing saeed's intelligence this whole episode Mm -hmm. they're trying to establish him as like a valid source all the time so i feel like this is just kind of going into that right but it's interesting Because he's not a pilot, so I'm not sure why he thinks that. I guess we don't have any background on him, so for all we know, he is a pilot. (laughs) Right. Like, I always... He's so capable with all this stuff with the transceiver. Right. Like, I don't even... I don't really question him. (laughs) Right. Me either. He's probably right. (laughs) Yeah. If he said he was a pilot, I'd be like, okay, sure. Yeah. I'm sure he knows all about that. (laughs) If if you're a pilot and also a doctor and a computer technician, (laughs) it's... Seems right. Seems... I agree. (laughs) Yeah, he's just so confident when he talks about things. (laughs) He really is. (laughs) Charlie bursts onto the beach calling for help. Michael, Boone, and a few other guys run off to the caves to help. But first, Boone asks Shannon to take over the antenna job while he's gone. Shannon agrees right away. Which surprised me a little bit. I expected a little resistance. Or, I can't do it, you know? Right. I'm too busy reading my magazines and tanning. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Charlie is trying to tell Kate about Jack, but he finds Sawyer instead. Sawyer promises that he'll tell Kate for him and says he should go get back to doing whatever it is he does around here. In a flashback, Charlie and Liam are having the time of their life performing you all, everybody. (laughs) Until Liam takes Charlie's part during the chorus. After the show, Charlie is upset, but Liam tells him it won't happen again before grabbing a beautiful girl and pulling out some drugs. Charlie looks very worried, and Liam tells him to chill. Oh, it's so sad. (laughs) No. I I feel like I didn't count it, but so many of these scenes end with Liam saying, Relax. Chill. It's fine. Yeah. (laughs) That is his whole vibe until the very end of the episode. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. It's so hard, too, when he starts singing the chorus and Charlie has that look on his face. Just heartbroken. Yeah. It's like, why are you doing this? That was my moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My one moment. Because I'm sure as a bass player, he doesn't, like he says, like, that was the one song I actually get to sing on. He took it from me. <laughs> hey, Charlie, it's your one song that's successful, too. So you take it. <laughs> right. You should be proud. Michael arrives at the caves and tells everyone he has experience in construction and they need to be careful with how they remove the rocks. 
They don't want the rocks to fall in and hurt Jack. He asks Walt to back away, and Walt says that they should go get Mr. Locke's help. <laughs> I love that he calls him Mr. Locke. <laughs> I know, it's really cute for some reason. <laughs> Hurley says he's off in the jungle killing stuff, which is probably true. Yeah. Michael arranges an assembly line, and everyone gets to work while Walt looks on curiously. I love that Walt's first reaction is, we need Locke. Because yeah. <laughs> he has gathered that Locke is the one who knows how to take care of stuff. And he hasn't seen his father be capable. So I think this scene, the way it ends with Walt staring at his father, I think it's him realizing that his his dad has something to contribute here. Yeah, it's interesting. It makes me think that maybe Walt suspects that Michael wasn't the one who brought Vincent back. Oh. Because you could argue that that is the one thing that Michael has done for Walt that would make him seem capable. But maybe Walt's like, I, I know you, Dad. Like, <laughs> I know. I know Locke was really behind this whole thing. <laughs> I saw Locke whittling that whistle for like three days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing gets by this kid. <laughs> right. Yeah. I just kind of like his genuine admiration to see his dad take charge of everything it's sweet yeah it is <laughs> sawyer finds kate and saeed and says he has to tell her something she is angry and says what makes you think i'm interested in anything you have to say sawyer looks upset and like he is changing his mind so instead he says just came to tell you you were right about me and i don't help anyone but myself here i am ready to pitch in kate rolls her eyes and walks away and sawyer follows Oh, I hate this so much. What do you hate about it? It's just, it's so petty of him not to tell her about Jack. It's just, ugh. I mean, they've, like, I get that Sawyer, I mean, Kate kind of said, what the hell are you doing here? Which was, I guess, kind of rude. But, I mean, they've been trading jabs ever since they got on this island. That's kind of their whole dynamic. So mm -hmm. I feel like... Her saying that to him doesn't justify him not telling her about Jack in that way and knowing that she he he knows he knows exactly what this is gonna do to her. I mean, what just imagine for a second if Jack had not made it out of the caves and had died. Kate would have one either killed Sawyer or for sure never <laughs> have talked to him ever again. I mean, that would have been so messed up. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> I just don't. It really makes me so mad. <laughs> you're so right. Like, you're totally right. <laughs> okay. Is that how you feel about it, too? <laughs> I mean, I think it's wrong, but I understand why it happens. I don't think he was planning to do this. I think it's something he does in the heat of the moment because he's upset. Mm -hmm. He definitely seems like he's going to tell her when he finds her, you know? Like, he, he looks like it, and he's like, hey, I have something to tell you. And it's because she's so, like, angry that he just puts his wall back up and is like, never mind. Like, I was going to do the helpful thing, but, you know. Right, and it's like, props to Sawyer. When he volunteered to just go and find Kate in the jungle to tell her about this, that kind of surprised me. I was like, oh, that's so nice of you. Like, you're obviously not going to get anything out of this. But then he just immediately flips it and just so frustrating. <laughs> I feel like he's frustrated because, one, he just gave her the battery for no reason other than she asked for it. Mm -hmm. And two, he just ran off in the jungle to go find her and tell her this. And after all this, which, you know, granted, it's not like super much, but, you know, to him, it's making effort. And, you know, to be treated so hostilely, I don't like, I understand why he's like, well, screw this. What is the point of trying to be helpful? I get nothing in return, you know? But, yeah, it's one of those things. <laughs> the escalation doesn't fit the crime, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like, I, I understand where it's coming from, but I don't agree with it. <laughs> right. It's just such, like you said, it's just he went from, like, zero to ten in like one move i can understand why he would 
be a little hurt and frustrated with Kate, but I mean, that is just not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hobbling through the jungle, Charlie finds Locke and tells him about Jack and that he needs his stash. He can't stand feeling this way. Locke shows Charlie a moth cocoon and gives him a brief explanation on moths and why they are way more kick-ass than butterflies. <laughs> the moth is struggling inside of the shell. Locke says he could cut the cocoon open and the moth would be free, but the struggle is nature's way of strengthening it. Locke looks at Charlie knowingly and asks Charlie if he wants to ask for his drugs a third time. I freaking love Locke so freaking much. Yes, this scene is fantastic. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I, he just, ugh, he gets it. He gets everything. And he just, I feel like he can always point to the island and use it to explain everything. Yeah, in such in such an intelligent and insightful way, too, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the way it steps up every time, like... Charlie asks the first time, and he's like, he's got the boar, and now he's got this moth, and he's explaining everything, and you just, you know the third time is going to be epic. Yeah, it's so perfect. It's almost like he planned this whole thing. It's, <laughs> it's just great. <laughs> yeah, I like the dynamic between the two of them. Yeah, I do too. Like I think I said in the last episode, he feels very paternal toward Charlie. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's really what Charlie needs. Like, yeah. that's what he needs from Liam, and Liam does not give it to him. Yeah, it makes me wonder, actually, what Charlie's parents are like. I mean, we don't get any mention of what his dad is like or his mom. Yeah. They're even around. But that would be – I don't remember if they explore that later on, but that would be so interesting to see. Yeah, because your kids turned out very different. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> Saeed asks Sawyer to climb a tree and place the at- antenna if he wants to be helpful. Sawyer hops to it, and while he's gone, Saeed warns Kate that he doesn't trust Sawyer. She replies, who does? And he clarifies that he doesn't trust Sawyer with Kate. She says she can handle him, and Saeed smiles and nods. This is the scene. Is this what you were talking about, too, with yeah, Saeed? Yeah, is- exactly. It's like this little moment at the very end of it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I f- I feel like he's just being protective and it's right. like, it's so selfless. If this had been like almost any other guy, if this had been Jack or even Charlie, I feel like you could write this off as jealousy or rivalry, mm-hmm. but I just don't get that impression at all from him. I feel like he's genuinely just looking out for her. Yeah. He like genuinely cares that she's okay. He's so nice. It is so nice. It's so refreshing. <laughs> oh, it is. Especially after what Sawyer just did. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Saeed. We needed that. <laughs> yeah, we did. There's hope for humanity on this island after all. Yeah, it's a good palate cleanser. <laughs> <laughs> Back at the cave-in, Jack is still trapped, but they're able to talk, and he says he's pinned beneath some rocks. Michael says they can't make the tunnel any bigger, so someone needs to crawl in and unpin Jack. Charlie volunteers, claiming that everyone else has someone who cares about them and would be upset if they went missing. Charlie is alone. Let me do this, he says, and everyone agrees. Charlie's stepping up for his moment. Yep, he is. (laughs) I also, this doesn't have anything to do with Charlie, but I forget if it's in that last scene you just mentioned, but I love the moment when, I love the moment when Jin says something like, they're trying to figure out who's going to go in to save Jack. And Jin says something in, you know, Korean. And Hurley's like, we don't understand Chinese, man. And Michael goes, they're Korean. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Hurley has been saying Chinese the entire time so far. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm glad someone finally corrected him. Yeah, it's about time. But yeah, then Michael shares this look with Sun. It's just this little moment. It's just so much. Yes. I love it. <laughs> Yeah. He does that again later when they're like, everything's okay. And he and Walt are talking and Walt's like, hey, can we live in the caves? And he looks over at Sun and he's like, uh. Yeah. (laughs) I need to stay away from this girl and her husband. Right. (laughs) 
It's such good follow up from last week's episode, though. Like they didn't have to put those details in there. Yeah, I love that they did. <laughs> Little subtle nods to everything, and I feel like a lot of this Sawyer stuff is going to lead into next week. Yes, they're pulling in from the last episode and they're setting you up for the next one all the time. Yeah, it's it's really well done. It's really well written. <laughs> Sawyer and Kate are waiting for Saeed's signal. Sawyer asks her what it is she likes about Jack. He theorizes that ladies just dig doctors, but that if they had some band-aids and peroxide, he could totally run this island too. (laughs) Kate is totally appalled and says, you can't be comparing yourself to Jack. (laughs) Sawyer looks hurt and says the difference between them isn't that big. He says... If he'd survived a few more weeks, you would have figured that out. Kate immediately looks devastated. Sawyer is studying her, and he tells her about the cave-in. She's furious, and Sawyer tells her to look on the bright side. Now she has someone else to pity. She immediately runs off. (sighs) (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) I feel like him saying that, now you have someone else to pity, shows how much it bothered him that she said that about him. Yeah, it really did. Which is so interesting because, again, I feel like they've just been trading jabs since they got on this island. Yeah. So there was something about that line that, like you said, really, really bothered him. Yeah, definitely. But oh, it's like, I mean, do you feel better now, Sawyer? Like, is this what you wanted? <laughs> Is this what you were going for? I feel like he's thinking, you expect me to be this jerk? Fine. I'm going to be this jerk. Like, that's how I read him right now. It's like defiant jerkery. (laughs) Yeah, it is. It is. And he's just kind of sleazy about it, too. It's just... Of course. Oh, it kills me. (laughs) But I do love that Kate immediately is like, peace out. Like, I don't have time for this. Yeah. I gotta go, I gotta go find out what happened to Jack. Priorities. I'll yell at you later. (laughs) Right. Jack is more important. (laughs) Charlie is about to go in after Jack when we flash back to him backstage at a show. Liam is clearly enjoying the rocker life, but Charlie is angry that Liam missed sound check that day. Charlie has had it. He says they have to walk away. Liam is killing himself and he's killing the band. But Liam says he is drive shaft. Nobody even knows who the bass player is. He refuses to walk away and he tells Charlie he can't walk either because if he's not in the band, what use is he? Liam storms out. Charlie sits down alone and he picks up a bag of Liam's drugs, crying. And oh my god. (laughs) It is so heartbreaking. Ugh. Oh, the scene kills me. Same. He is so sad. I don't just mean like Charlie is sad. Like, it's the saddest situation. Yeah, this is like deeply damaging to him. You can tell. Yeah. Liam broke him. Right. This is Ugh. this is the breaking point. Right. This is the point where he turned to heroin like his brother. Do you feel like this is Liam's fault Or, like, how much blame do we place on Liam? And how much do we place on Charlie? Yeah, you know, I always think about that when I watch this episode. Because I always want to just say... I always just want to blame Liam entirely. Right. But, I mean, Liam didn't make Charlie pick up those drugs. Exactly. But it's hard, because I feel like when I watch this, like, whenever I get to this scene, I'm like, oh, Charlie didn't even have a chance. He never had a chance. As far as, you know, not getting hooked on heroin. Right. I mean, they were in this band and Charlie obviously looks up to his brothers so much. And all the things that Liam says to him in this scene is just, I mean, it's just so sad. It's just so emotionally, like, you know, to have your older brother say those things to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really just never had a chance. Yeah, he really didn't. I feel like the only step that Liam did not take into making this happen is to pressure charlie into doing this right you know i don't feel like he was like come on charlie just have some you know Mm -hmm. that's like the only redemption (laughs) for liam right here but uh i mean i have all the compassion in the world for charlie he's alone he's completely out of his element 
His brother, right. his brother's totally shutting him out. Again, I understand. I don't agree. <laughs> yeah, it's so hard because you, like, he has Charlie has good intentions. Mm-hmm. I mean, he does. You get the sense that unlike Liam, he wants to be in the band because he is all about the music. Like that's the most important thing to him. And then in the first flashback, he was going to quit because he just couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. Until Liam convinced him not to. So, oh, it's so heartbreaking. (laughs) It is. And I get the feeling that this is when Liam says, if you're not in this band, what the bloody hell use are you? It kind of makes me think that that's one of the reasons why Charlie is always talking about Drive Shaft. Yes. And like being like, hey, have you heard of Drive Shaft, this band I'm in? Because he feels like if it's he doesn't have that, then like Liam said, what what good is he? Right. Exactly. I had the same thought. It's so nice how these moments in their past help you understand everything that these characters do. It all connects. Right. It's so well done. <laughs> As Charlie crawls through the tunnel, more rocks begin falling. He makes it to Jack just in time, telling him he's here to rescue him. Because he's Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Total Star Wars he reference, is. right? <laughs> wow, didn't pick up on that either. <laughs> What's wrong with me? I feel like Lost has a lot of Star Wars references. Not so far, but keep an eye out. <laughs> we should keep an eye out for that. That's so interesting. Yeah, J.J. Abrams is a big fan of Star Wars, obviously. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah, I just thought about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> <laughs> I also feel like... When Charlie was crawling through that cave, it's it reminded me of when Locke was talking about the moth coming out of the cocoon. Yes, me too. Yeah, I thought about it more when he breaks through the ground uh, oh, later. Okay. But like this is the same thing. This is him struggling, you know? Right. Oh, it's such a good freaking metaphor. Yeah, everything is all the little details just come full circle it's fantastic this episode is like the most intricate jigsaw puzzle and it all fits together perfectly oh it's lovely (laughs) kate arrives at the caves super upset asking if jack is alive they tell her they don't know kate begins furiously pulling rocks out of the way and the assembly line picks back up because like kate said what the heck is everybody doing like right (laughs) Stop sitting around to save Jack and Charlie at this point. Seriously, they're just, like, forming a new battle plan? Like, just pick up where you left off, dudes. Right. There's no other options. (laughs) Inside the cave, Charlie unpins Jack, who tells him that he also needs to pop his dislocated shoulder back in for him. Jack gives him some instructions. Charlie's nervous, but Jack tells him that he can do this. Charlie twists, and he pushes, and he does it. Ugh. (laughs) <laughs> are you squeamish <laughs> i mean not about most things but like things with bones oh i hate that i <laughs> don't know why my husband dislocates his shoulder all the time so <laughs> what i have seen are this you... happen <laughs> oh it's like my worst nightmare yeah he like oh. pulls a rigs from lethal weapon and slams himself up against the walls all the time oh that is awful i'm used oh to seeing God. this horrible stuff happen <laughs> Wow. He's going to love that I shared that. <laughs> that is that is literally horrifying to me. <laughs> <I can't. laughs> in another flashback, Charlie is visiting Liam in Australia. Liam has clearly grown up. He has a daughter and a nice suburban home. Charlie is excited for Drive Shaft's comeback, and he wants Liam to join the band again. He says, I'm asking you like you once asked me. Liam sees that Charlie is still a junkie. And he's upset. But Charlie yells, you did this to me. You took away the music from me. Liam wants Charlie to go to rehab. He's just trying to look out for him. But Charlie says Liam has never looked out for him. And he has a plane to catch. This is not where I was expecting this story to go. No. And I love that it does. Me too. It's such a good, unexpected twist. And the actor who plays Liam... His name is Neil Hopkins. He does such a good job with the contrast of being the strung out, drug addicted rock star to, I mean, he's obviously gone to rehab and has a whole different life now. It's incredible. Yeah. 
No, and he you're right, he does a good job of playing both sides of that character. And also it's just so sad. Whenever I watch the scene, I always think, Oh, that was the last conversation they probably had before Charlie got on that plane. Exactly. And then I'm you know, is now presumed dead by Liam. Like, can you imagine the guilt he must be <laughs> feeling? Yeah. Ugh. Awful. I was wondering, since Charlie says like he's clearly blaming all of this on Liam. He keeps saying, you did this to me. Right. Well, he's in Australia to visit Liam. So when they crashed, is he thinking, God, Liam did this to me. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. He, he might be. <laughs> I totally get why he is so angry with Liam. But I don't think Liam did this to him. I think Liam didn't do anything to help him. Charlie's right that he never looked out for him. But... Charlie has done this to himself, and I think that's what he's got to realize. Right. It's like you said, you can he can blame the fact that Liam never looked out for him, neglected him, treated him like dirt a lot of the time, but the specific addiction to heroin, yeah, Liam never put that in his hands and was like, hey, or at least we didn't ever see him do that, you know? <laughs> right. Like, he so. may have put him in the situation because Charlie was so resistant to even being in the band in the first place but i don't think it's i don't think it's fair for him to say you did this to me yeah that was charlie's own choice right like clearly liam was able to make his own choice and eventually made the right one to go get some help and get his life together right and at the same time it's totally i totally get it because it's such i mean it's such an a sibling thing, to, especially if you're a younger sibling, to kind of, you know, want to do everything your older sibling does. Mm -hmm. And when they're in the band together, they're obviously spending, you know, so much time together touring and making music. I, I totally get it. It's just, it just says it's an interesting take on, you know, adult sibling relationships, I think. Yeah, definitely is. It's a really hard line because... Liam did, Liam did just about as much as he could to get Charlie to that point. So I don't, it's, this is a, such a struggle because, you know, <laughs> Charlie is the one we sympathize with. He's the one who we're connected to. Right. And yet I'm like, Charlie, you're being weak. Like you need to step up. Yeah. And that's what Locke has been encouraging him to do this whole time. Because he knows that if you just take those drugs away from him, that doesn't do anything to strengthen who Charlie is. It doesn't make right. him a better person. It just makes him free of drugs. Right, exactly. We'll get into that scene soon, so I'm going to keep going because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Jack asks Charlie in the cave how long it's been since his last fix. He asks why he didn't ask for help. Charlie says he already thinks he's useless, so he didn't want Jack to think he was a junkie, too. Jack tells him that rescuing him is far from useless. Charlie points out that this little cave feels much like a confessional, where this whole episode began. Where Charlie was more himself. Charlie notices a moth flying in the cave and begins to move rocks out of the way to follow it towards the light. Eventually, like a moth breaking from its cocoon, he manages to break through the ground on the other side of the cave. He and Jack walk around to the people digging in the front, and Kate, who's been digging nonstop, runs towards Jack and gives him a hug. Hurley totally wins, though, and hugs Charlie right off his feet, congratulating <laughs> him on a job well done. Charlie looks very proud. Oh, I love everything about this. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting for the Randy happy sigh of approval. <laughs> it's just so lovely. It is. It's so sweet. Oh. I like both I like both reunions. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Yeah, and the way Kate is just literally killing herself to get to Jack and he just walks out. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so cute. <laughs> I don't have anything constructive to say about this. It's just really adorable. Okay. There's nothing constructive to say about it. It's perfect. <laughs> oh. And I like I like how when um Charlie and Jack were talking in the cave and you know Charlie confesses or Jack figures out that he's going through withdrawals and Jack says, you know, we all get to start over. It's the same thing he told Kate. Yeah. When Kate was going to tell him 
what she did. I I like that quality about Jack. He's just very non-judgmental. Like everyone kind of has put him up on this pedestal or most everyone and sees him as a hero, but Jack's, you know, he kind of gives off the feeling that hey, I've got my issues too. Like Right. You don't have to be perfect. I'm not perfect too either. Right. Yeah. I like that too. I I like Jack in this episode. I have oh my God. I have zero issues with Jack in this episode. What? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Wow, that is. I can't amazing. think of any issues. Maybe I do. I probably do if I want. To. If I want to find one, I could. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> no, but this is the Jack that I wish he was all the time. I I really like him in this episode because he's he is being a leader, but he's doing it quietly. He's mm-hmm. leading by example. You know, he's reassuring Charlie. He's trying to help him. I like him. Yeah, this is the best version of him in this episode. Yes. Most definitely. This is the best Jack. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I watched that scene where Jack and Kate reunited like five times. <laughs> FYI. It's just one of my favorite scenes between them. But anyway. <laughs> it's a good scene, especially coming off the back of their argument on the beach. Yeah. Because it, clearly it doesn't matter. They're more concerned about if each other are okay, then if they agree. Mm -hmm. Saeed sets off his rocket, signaling that it's time to turn on your antenna. Shannon sets hers off, and Sawyer sets off his. And I I had this moment where I was like, oh, God, Saeed is relying on Shannon and Sawyer, of all people. Right, (laughs) right. And they both came through. They did. They both came through. So surprised. (laughs) It's a good thing. Saeed turns the transceiver on, and he's very excited because it's working when someone knocks him on the head with a very large stick. (laughs) Dun-dun-dun. Exactly. (laughs) At the caves, Charlie is experiencing intense withdrawal symptoms, but Jack covers for him, telling Hurley that Charlie has the flu. Which is a very nice moment from Jack. Yeah. Best Jack. It was very nice of him. I love that. (laughs) Yep. Walt says he likes the caves, and he asks Michael if they could live here. But Michael looks at Sun and Jin and seems pretty doubtful. (laughs) Yeah, and also, last week, Michael was like, hell no, I'm not moving to the caves. I'm waiting for rescue on the beach. Yeah. (laughs) Clearly, he didn't consult Walt about that. (laughs) Right. As soon as Walt made that suggestion, he's like, oh, maybe. (laughs) See, I feel like he was like, uh, hell no. (laughs) Oh, okay. Yeah, probably. (laughs) Because he's totally scared of living near Jen. (laughs) Which I would be, too. Yeah. Kate gives Jack a handmade sling for his arm. She points out the irony of his getting hurt in the case, which he said were so safe. (laughs) He tells her it was a fluke. They're both hoping that Saeed's plan worked and that they're one step closer to getting off the island. Only they actually don't seem too happy about that prospect. Ugh. I, uh, I love them so much. <laughs> They're just so cute. I've actually, I remember when I first watched this episode, the very first time, I thought for sure they were going to get together, like right now. Like they were going to kiss? Yes. I was like, this is episode seven. You've been building this up so much. It was so obvious to me. And then when they just kind of sat there, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you <laughs> Never <did>. mind. <laughs> you didn't realize that the patience you would be required to have for Lost. <laughs> and you know, it's a good thing because I, I, uh, I don't know if I would have kept watching if I told what, how their story was going to go. <laughs> but yeah, I like the way at the end, I do like the way they can just kind of sit with each other and not say anything. Yeah. And it's not... It's not awkward. It's just... I like the way they talk about leaving the island and how neither of them seem very happy about it. Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, we could uh, get back to our lives. Yeah. Right. That'd be really nice. I could go to jail and I could deal with my father who's dead, whose body is disappeared. (laughs) Like, like, no thanks. I can explain that situation. (laughs) Yeah. In the final scene of the episode, Charlie approaches Locke and asks him for a third time to give him the drugs. Locke looks disappointed, and he hands them over. Charlie takes the bag and throws it into the fire. Locke tells him he's proud, that he knew he could do it, and Charlie tears up, watching a moth fly away, smiling. Dear God. (laughs) 
It's so good. It's so good. It's such like a beautiful, hopeful ending. Yes, that's what I wrote too. I wrote beautiful. Also, I think I love endings where things burn in fire. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Because <laughs> with Locke's episode, he burned the wheelchair in the fire. Oh, yeah. We'll have to keep an eye on that. <laughs> Which was also directed by Jack Bender. So clearly this is him o- his M.O. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's such a nice ending. It ties everything up. And for that moment, you're just terrified that after all this charlie would go back to his drugs like yes my stomach just drops when i see that happen oh i know yeah and it's like charlie just needed that affirmation from someone that he wasn't useless right he needed somebody who would just believe in him right and it's crazy because you know they're virtually strangers i'm just like why do you put so much stock into what these people think but like clearly that's who he is like he wants to make the people around him happy and he's doing that at the expense of himself right it's like you said earlier charlie he just needs affirmation from people whether it be about him not being useless or about drive shaft you know i mean he's gone on every almost every trip they've gone on in the jungle charlie's right there volunteering or coming along he just needs that sense of community do you know what i mean (laughs) yeah i think so i think that's true he's always contrasted like there's charlie with people and then charlie alone you know he does the drugs when he's alone even in his flashbacks like Mm -hmm. it's not till liam leaves and he's by himself that he does it so clearly he needs that community to rally behind him yeah i completely agree So this kind of leads into the question that I thought of for this episode. Okay. Which was, how do we keep others from deciding who we really are? I feel like that is Charlie's struggle. I feel like Liam is forcing this persona on him that is not who Charlie is. I'm interested to know who Charlie really is. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we really know yet since, you know, he's been on drugs this whole time. Right. And when the episode starts, you know, it seems like he's a pretty religious guy. He seems into the music, but other than that, finds the whole music life unappealing. And yet that's all we've heard Charlie talk about, you know? So, yeah, I think Liam is a huge influence on deciding for Charlie who he is. And Charlie's just not strong enough to resist his expectations. Hmm. Yeah, that's so true. I feel like it's... It's very, that question is very relatable too, because I feel like, at least I know I struggle with, I guess, a version of not trying not to let other people define who I am. Yeah, like who doesn't really? I think right. everyone struggles with that in some way. Like Charlie is just struggling with it in so many ways. You know, he doesn't want, he doesn't want Jack to find him useless. He wants to impress Locke. Like he's just, he's very into other people's opinions of him. Right. I think that's why he's talking about drive shaft all the time. Like, he wants people to be impressed. Yeah, he wants to not feel useless. Right. He wants to feel like he's contributing something, some kind of something. Right, exactly. Oh, that's such a good question. I love that. (laughs) (laughs) And I feel like it applies to the whole Sawyer storyline as well, because... Every time Sawyer wants to do something good in this episode, Kate is right there to remind him that he is bad. So by the end, Sawyer conforms to her expectations, and he does the wrong thing. Yeah, I can see that. Oh, Sawyer. (laughs) (laughs) I think they're both giving a lot of power to people's perceptions of them. Like, it's only when Charlie is confident enough to hold himself accountable that he does the right thing. Sawyer never does. Like, he hasn't gotten to that point. Right. Which is frustrating, especially when he's compared, or when you compare him to to where Charlie ends, you know, where he gets by the end of this episode. Right. This was the episode where we learned Charlie's baggage, and we're not sure what is making Sawyer tick at this point. Oh, next week is going to be interesting. (laughs) You freaking bet it is. (laughs) I'm so jazzed. (laughs) I know you're really excited to be leading the episode all about Sawyer. I mean, 
when we planned how we would do these episodes, I don't think we really... <laughs> You're doing all the Jack ones, I'm doing all the story ones. I know, it's completely unfair. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> Why did we do this to ourselves? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's more unbiased that way. Maybe it's better. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and I can just, you know... Focus on watching the beautiful Sawyer episode while you're busy writing all the notes. It works out. Yeah. When I was thinking about a theme for this episode, I was thinking about um, I was thinking about survival of the fittest. Ooh. Which when Locke when Locke and Charlie had that scene together, and Locke was talking about how um, struggle is nature's way of strengthening the moth, like when it's has to work its way out of the cocoon. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was just thinking you can make the argument that, you know, the island or even Locke are, are trying to eliminate, you know, the weak players on the island. Like, I, I just kept thinking about Jack's episode a, a couple of weeks ago where he kind of had to go through this test, you know, thinking he was going crazy, seeing his father in the jungle and then Locke kind of helped him get through that so mm -hmm. it kind of seems like the island is testing people right presenting challenges to them. right and I feel like you could also make that case for Locke too since he is one with the island like he's doing the same thing right and I feel yeah and like Charlie this was Charlie's week to get tested and he when he was able to give her the drugs at the end he was able to survive a couple weeks ago, it was Jack. And then you could also make the argument that Locke was also being tested when he, you know, saw whatever the monster was in the in the jungle, and he survived that. It kind of, it just reminded me of, like, it was tying it all back to Locke's faith in the island. Right. Do you think of the island as its own character? Yeah. I'm finding that as we're watching this critically, I'm thinking of that more and more. I feel like I am too. Really? Yeah. And it makes me think that those rocks falling on Jack doesn't have to be a coincidence. Right. Yeah. I wrote the same thing because it's like he said at the beginning of the episode to Kate, I wish I shared your faith. And then he almost died in the cave in. So. <laughs> right. And later Kate even points it out. She's like, so those safe caves. Huh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, I feel like, because I I like Locke, but I feel like I've said this before, but he, he does some things in the show that are, I, I just, ugh, I don't like at all. So I'm kind of, <laughs> I mean, he does things I like too. So I'm, as I were watching this, I'm kind of trying to pay a little bit more attention to him and kind of just trying to figure out how he works. Is he doing things right now that you don't like, or are you just referring to like... Things you know are coming. Just things I know are coming. The only thing the only thing he's done right now is the whole thing with almost getting Charlie killed by the boar. But, I mean, that's, <laughs> he knew what he was doing, so that's not a big deal, I guess. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm completely taken with Locke. I'm just enchanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever he has to say. I'm here to listen. <laughs> yeah, he's so engaging. He is, and he just embodies all the mystery on the island. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we've said before, like, that's that's what I come here for. That's what I love about Lost is all the mystery and the questions and is this right, is this wrong? And it seems like that's what Locke's here for, too. Right. And that's not necessarily the first thing I come to Lost for. Right. So I'm going to try to pay more attention to it when we go through it. I think I think it's the kind of thing that comes up more as you're looking at this critically like we are. Right. So I think it's more natural to be focused on it now, whereas when you're watching it live as, as it's airing, you know, we didn't know what was coming mm -hmm. and it's easier to get caught up in the week to week. Yeah, definitely. I just love this episode. It's so good. It's so perfect. It takes no steps wrong. Yeah, I'm glad you liked it as much as I did. Me too. I'm glad we agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of nice. It is nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's going to do it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. If you have thoughts of your own that you would like to share with us, we would love to hear them. 
You can email us directly at Tiffany or at Randy at thelostpodcast.com. Or you can send us a message through Facebook or Instagram. All our information is on our website, thelostpodcast.com. If you're enjoying the show and you'd like to help us support it, you can rate, review, and subscribe to Freckles and Blondie on iTunes, or you can send us a donation through our Patreon page. Remember that if you don't have a dollar to spare, that's beyond fine. Instead, just share this podcast with someone that you know who also loves Lost. Your reviews on iTunes and your sharing the podcast with friends are what will help us grow, and we appreciate everything that you've done so far. Yes, definitely. Next week, we'll be discussing episode eight, Confidence Man. Yay! Get ready, guys. (laughs) That's going to be very interesting. It's going to be the best episode ever. (laughs) Yeah, we'll see. (laughs) Actually, I don't even remember exactly what happens. I just know it's Sawyer. Me either. So, yeah. (laughs) I I might not even be that jazzed about it. Who knows? (laughs) Okay. I doubt it. Yeah, me too. (laughs) So yeah, tune in next week, guys, when we're going to be discussing Confidence Man. And again, if you have any opinions that you'd like to share, if you have opinions on Jack and Sawyer or anybody on the show, please get in touch with us. We would love to hear from you. And that's going to do it. I'm Randy. I'm Tiffany. And this has been Freckles and Blondie.